This audiobook is for educational purposes and is for personal use only. God Never Fails Part 7 to 9 by Mary Cupfill. 7. Act on Belief. Is it hard for you to have faith today? Is it harder today to be steadfast in faith than it was yesterday? If so, then be grateful rather than dismayed, for therein lies your reward. It exists even within that seeming inability to remain firm in absolute faith. The strong, steady light of unwavering faith of those whom you have seen surmount obstacles and overcome adverse conditions has grown within their hearts in the same way yours is growing within you now. They, too, have prayed not one prayer of faith, but many. There are problems that try us all, to the very point of despair and heartbreak, and yet, it is at that point we can arise to our greatest conviction and the most powerful authority as children of God. It is at that point we take another step forward into a steadier and more assured consciousness of the reality of good. The Father has not mocked his beloved heirs by placing within them a meager supply of faith, just enough to meet a few small trials, but has bestowed upon all a glorious and resurrecting faith more than sufficient to meet every need. Whether it is the appearance of illness trying your faith in health, whether it is the appearance of lack trying your faith in abundance, or the appearance of fear and inlumony trying your faith in love, you have within yourself a spirit of faith greater than any physical appearance or any false belief or obstacle. The Father has given you this faith, and has meant it for good, has meant it for an active, living force of good. It is by positive action that our faith in God, in good develops and waxes strong. A friend, sorely tried in many ways, wrote recently, there was a time when I thought it would be impossible to make the trip to a government hospital and undergo necessary examinations. I was informed two weeks before the time to go and immediately began to pray and to change my fearful thinking into positive thoughts about the matter. I was delighted and surprised too at the way God gave me the power to overcome fear and to have peace of mind throughout the two weeks and during the trip. Now that I have been retired and one phase of my life has been changed, I'm sure another will start soon for me I can hardly wait to learn what it will be, this is faith. This is faith that is active, uniting heart and mind with its rightful inheritance of every good thing. This is faith that is being put to daily use. Are you thinking, but I don't have that much faith. I wish I did I wish I had more. I wish I had the courage to believe I can be healed, or prospered, or loved, but suppose I begin, and cannot finish then I would have less faith than I have now, listen, beloved of God. The Father has not given you a spirit of fear or weakness or insufficiency but of power and love. All the content of his heavenly kingdom is to be claimed not by might but by faith the kind we glimpse within the heart, then put into thought, word, and deed. It is through daily exercise that our faith becomes stronger. It is by believing in the good we wish for, by daily and hourly expecting the good we hope for, by beginning to put that wish and that hope to active use, that we become more and more aware of the unlimited possibilities of faith. Years ago, at a time when jobs were quite scarce, a young man was seeking a way to enter the business world. Although he was interested in truth studies and knew the value of prayer, his attempts to apply the principles of prayer to his own life had not been successful. He finally voiced his difficulties to a lifelong friend, how am I ever going to get a job? No one seems to want my services, and I don't know how to go about helping myself. What can I do? The older man looked at his young friend searchingly and replied simply, Start your own business. You once told me of an idea you had for a business. Well move a little. Take the first step. You said you wanted to sell electrical equipment. For that purpose you will need some kind of an office. Get yourself a room. It need not be an elaborate or expensive one. Then prepare yourself for selling. This was the only advice the young man received, but as he walked down the street a few moments later, he found that he was stepping briskly in cadence with these thoughts, get yourself a room. Move a little. Take the first step. Within a few days he had secured an office, which was small, but in a respectable location. 
Within a few more days he had ordered some business cards. For a time the office remained quite empty, but gradually it took the form of a progressive place of business. Phone, desk, and chairs were added, along with files and other needed equipment. Sales began to come in as he faithfully and zealously made the rounds, described his equipment to potential customers, and handed out his business cards. Within less than a year there was a large amount of electrical equipment being handled through this office, and there was an eager clientele ready to purchase. The young man had also acquired a partner to share in his growing sales work. Many years later this person, then a successful businessman, remarked, It was the simple suggestion of my friend that helped me to understand there was more to cooperating with God than just sitting and praying. I knew then that I had to move a little as well as pray a lot. I had to move my feet in the direction I wanted to go. If you desire to attain some high goal, to express some talent, or to enter some purposeful activity, set your mind and heart in its direction, pray, and then, move your feet, accordingly. Do not feel that your beginning step need be one that will claim great attention. The beginning step need only be a simple way of showing the Father that you believe in His kingdom and His promises that you believe in your divine sonship and inheritance of good. Day by day take the steps at hand. Know that with each step and each bit of guidance received there is steady progress toward the attainment of the good you are seeking. If at times it seems that some of your activities are unrelated to your highest dream, only persist the more diligently in following through to the best of your ability. You will then see the value of every effort and you will see the harmonious pattern gradually coming into manifestation. It takes inner faith and outer application of our faith to attain our goals and to reach the high point of fruition in our lives, work, and affairs. We have our portion to do, and God has His. In order to do our share we must move and the best way we can for the moment, for God is ever moving in His best way for our highest good. The more joyously we enter into this cooperative process, the more easily, happily, and successfully we will complete each step of our journey toward perfection. If someone we know well were to relate to us one wonderful experience after another of healing, of supply evidenced in their life through faith, if he were to tell us of the marvelous works faith had wrought for him in this day, it might mean more to us than if we read story after story of healing and blessing in Jesus' time. It would bring home to us the truth that faith knows no favored time nor age, but is as powerful a force today as it was two thousand years ago, and as it yet will be two thousand years hence. And yet, it is not, as Job says, by the hearing of the ear, that our faith becomes strong, but when we can say, Now my I seethed thee, when we can see within our heart what faith means to us personally when we can feel its power and presence within our own life experience, when it becomes to us a living word whose whisper rises above and silences every clamoring doubt and fear. The most frequent the device of the Master given to those who came to Him for healing and help, was simply, believe, have faith, why? Because faith is the basis for the fulfillment of every good thing in our life. Faith in perfect well-being is the basis, the substance, of all health. Faith in abundance is the basis, the substance, of all supply. Faith in harmony is the basis, the substance, of all love. It is the basis of all the, greater works, the way Shower has told us we are to do today. Many persons, long ago, thought they sought a man named Jesus, a man with extraordinary gifts of healing and blessing, someone who could offer them freedom and liberation from their fears and ills. But they actually sought, and within their inmost being they desired for themselves, communion with the Christ Spirit, which the man Jesus exemplified, a oneness with the spiritual nature he portrayed. It is the same with us today. There may be two thousand calendar years between the seekers of old and ourselves, but the inner needs are the same, the spiritual desires are the same, and the kingdom and its laws remain unchanged. You and I need to turn within acknowledge and put to use the faith already within our hearts, in order that we may begin to behold with the, inner eye, the wonders of our individual heritage of a living faith. That is what faith is, the movement of the inner longing for good into living action, 
thought, word, and deed. Whatever your need of this moment, for health, strength, courage, supply, happiness, whatever it may be within you, not within someone else you think more accomplished and gifted, dwells the vital life substance and power of all the good you can desire. Yes, you have within you all the faith you need for the perfect manifestation of any good thing. God did not promise that it is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom and then go back on his promise. He did not give you the inspiration of the life of his beloved son, and then expect you to forget the wonders of that life. Divine purpose leaves behind that glorious promise, and divine purpose leaves within the story of the master's life. The Father intends for you and me to believe him and follow through with that belief by putting it into our thoughts, words, and actions. He intends for you and me to walk in the footsteps of the way shower and actively put to use the things we have been taught. He intends for us to realize that the faith within us is a dynamic faith of mighty works. There is a divine design constantly at work each day. This divine design is cooperating with you unceasingly and inviting you to work with it to bring harmony into your life. Nothing is meaningless or futile in your life when divine mind works in and through every circumstance and every condition in your life. If an endeavor is to become fruitful, there must be both spiritual and physical action. In your desire to go forward you must cooperate, or, move a little, you must move more of your thought into prayer, a few more words into constructive speaking and a few more steps into service. As you fulfill your part you permit God to fulfill his purpose in and through your mind, body, and affairs. We need to seek no further for the step to take to achieve harmony and perfection in our lives. We need seek no pretentious way to follow, for divine mind is already stirring within us. Our part is simply to align heart, mind, hands, and feet with it. Our part is simply to, move a little, today in prayer, move a little, in thought, word, and deed, and let God take care of the rest. Move a little, and you will find yourself within reach of your furthest goal, you will find the kingdom of heaven. As a child of God, confidence is my heritage, my true and natural state of mind. God created me in his own image and likeness and implanted a spirit of confidence within me, a spirit that believes in the outworking of good a spirit that is sure of his ever-present, loving protection and guidance. God is my help, and he is here now. In this I am confident. Despair is transformed into faith, darkness becomes light. I meet every situation and view every appearance with a fearless heart and a confident spirit. I trust God for my abundant supply. I remember Jesus' admonition to his followers, be not anxious. If God doth so clothe the grass of the field, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. I remember this promise and affirm, Father, you are my abundant supply. In this I am confident. I am confident that I am able to accomplish all things demanded of me. I am confident that God's wisdom in me is continually guiding and inspiring me. I am confident that my capabilities and talents have their source in him. I am confident that my every undertaking will be attended by success, for the powerful and accomplishing Spirit of God is with me. I am strengthened, renewed, and stabilized as I express confidence in God, in myself, and in my fellow men. God, all good, is the only presence and power in my life and affairs and in the universe. As a child of the Most High, I have the authority to choose each day what I will serve. I put my confidence in God and serve faith rather than fear, happiness rather than unhappiness, peace rather than confusion. I take into my heart and mind a new confidence today, remembering that I am the beloved of God, that I have not been given, a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I remember that God's divine and perfect purpose for me is good that he is with me, as power and life, wherever I am and in whatever I do. I remember that God has confidence in me, that he created me in his own image and placed his own spirit within me, that he knows all that I am capable of being and doing. God, in his infinite wisdom, 
has given me everything necessary for the perfect accomplishment of all the good desires of my heart. In this I am confident. 8. Speak the word. If you would demonstrate, attain, manifest greater good in your mind, body, and affairs, take time to speak aloud the word of truth. Speak the word of wisdom, wholeness, harmony. Speak it aloud in the privacy of your own room or home until the air vibrates with the divine ideas contained within it. If it is greater wisdom and understanding you desire, declare aloud, in a firm but gentle and confident manner, let there be light. Let the clear light of God's day shine through my mind, if you are in need of healing, decree, every cell of my body is indelibly stamped with a clear picture of radiant life. It now manifests that life, if you seem to lack any good thing, affirm, God is my unfailing, enduring, exhaustless supply. Do not strain or become tense or anxious in your speaking of these words, but repeat them in tones of peace, joy, and confidence, in the full awareness that it is the Father who does the work and brings forth the good results. Your part is to take hold of the divine idea in faith, speak the word in faith and then in faith leave the outworking of that idea to God. To help yourself realize the power of the divine idea indwelling in your spoken words, it is helpful to proceed in affirmation with the thought, my words are spirit, and they are life. They do not return unto me void, but prosper in the thing whereto I send them. This affirmation reminds us that it is not really the words that we speak that are so important but the spiritual idea contained within the words that is important. Knowing this truth also gives us a new feeling of strength and faith and conviction about our true words, their import and their miracle-producing activity. As a certain truth student prayed faithfully concerning her loved ones and gave thanks for the spiritual understanding she was receiving through a truth teacher, she felt suddenly impelled to speak a word of thanksgiving and appreciation for that teacher. Suddenly she said aloud, and, Father, an orchid to this good teacher, she thought no more about her words until, during the next class session, she was startled into remembering her prayer when the teacher remarked, It is always well for us to be open and receptive to our good because we never know just what nice surprise the Father has in store for us. This week he sent me an orchid through a completely surprising, unexpected channel. Whether we understand that we are cooperating with the divine law or not, the law is constantly at work in our life. If we cooperate with it, putting our words to constructive use, we accordingly see the benefit of the constructive results that become manifest in our life. This is one of the basic teachings of Jesus, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof. For by thy words thou shalt be justified and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Matthew, Mark, and Luke each give us the parable of the sower, as taught by the master, and each of them must have found this parable about sowing the word one of the most needful and important of Jesus' teachings. John, in his gospel, also emphasizes the word and its importance, recording for us these statements of Jesus, If ye abide in my word, then are ye truly my disciples. If a man love me, he will keep my word, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatsoever ye will, and it shall be done unto you. If you find it difficult to assert your authority over the negative aspects of health, think more deeply upon the meaning of the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. This name is the symbol of all the health and strength and wholeness that any man anywhere can ever desire. It is in this name that healing power to raise the dead and give new life to the sick and the lame became manifest, and the command and authority of this name has not diminished. It is still filled with life-giving essence, with renewing breath and strength sufficient to open a new channel in us for God's perfect creation to flow into beautiful manifestation in our body, mind, and affairs. There is not one among all mankind who has not received the gift of authority over all the earth given him by the Father Creator in the beginning. This gift is meant to be claimed and used as Jesus claimed and used it, to the glory of God and the upliftment of man and all other creation. Jesus, in telling us to follow him, to do as he did throughout his earthly life, 
wants us to discipline our thoughts and our words so that we, too, can say with him, I and the Father are one, I speak the things which I have seen with my Father, I know him, and keep his word. Some time ago, this became clear to a truth student as she sought her way out of financial difficulty. After working through prayer about her four vacant rooms, long unfilled by rumors, she suddenly awakened to the realization that Jesus spoke not only to man presenting himself for healing but to nature's elements and creations when he found it needful. Caught by the idea of the authority given every son of God, she decreed in new firmness and conviction, it is right for these rooms to be filled with fine rumors. I declare this house be put into useful service to mankind now, she explained to a truth counselor later that when she spoke the words in a tone of joyful command and thanksgiving she added emphasis to them by firmly striking the palm of her hand against the top of a table, deliberately impressing herself with the words through each physical action of her hand. She added, also, whenever a thought of fear or doubt would return to me, I quickly stamped my foot and said, get out of here, in a firm and decisive manner, and then again claimed the good I knew was my divine heritage. Each of these simple little outer actions helped me not only to gain the attention of my thoughts but also to control them more effectively. After placing an advertisement in the local newspaper for two days all four rooms were rented. This was three days after she declared her conviction through her spoken word and at a time many landlords were complaining about having vacancies. Sometimes a student will protest, but I have spoken the word of truth concerning this situation, and nothing has changed. If we are faithful and persistent in speaking the true word, the change will become manifest. Let us ask ourselves, has there been a constant, one-pointed direction of our mind to this truth? Many times when we pray we declare in positive and emphatic words the truth we desire to see manifested, and then, later on, throughout the day, express equally emphatic words exemplifying doubt, fear, and misgiving. It is for this reason that we need to repeat an affirmation again and again when we are experiencing a challenge or when we are facing an undesirable appearance. We need to repeat it until the truth it expresses is firmly rooted and grounded in the very depths of our soul, and no evidence to the contrary can move it. Jesus needed merely to say, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee, when the centurion requested that his servant be healed. He needed merely to say, I will, be thou made clean, to the leper, arise, and take up thy bed, and go unto thy house, to the palsied according to your faith be it done unto you, to the two blind men. He did not need to repeat and repeat and repeat the words over and over again, for the reason that the truth had been established within him and it had been established not haphazardly or carelessly, but through endless days and nights of prayer and silence when he must have decreed again and again the truths his father is so ready to share with all his children who will take time to listen and then speak as he speaks. If we find it necessary to speak the word of strength twice before it is manifest, that is all that is needful. But if we find it necessary to speak it twenty times, or two hundred times, or two thousand times, then we must be willing to speak it until the truth is immovable and solid and firm within the depths of our soul, our mind is steeped with it, our body temple is vibrant with it, our life is literally charged with it. Through our persistence in looking away from the appearance, through our constancy in looking within to the truth, through our faithful and steadfast thinking, speaking, and acting in accordance with the truth, the truth finds freedom of expression through us. A young girl, particularly desiring to attract right companions, took into her heart the affirmation, I am magnetic with the irresistible charm of spirit. Within a week she was blessed in having an unusual number of happy social times and met several fine new friends. Her mother, a good truth student, remarked later, The thing that impressed me about Jane's attitude was the feeling she put into her efforts. When she declared this truth for herself, she brought to bear on it all the faith and love and feeling she could master. Through years of habit many of us have unknowingly given great feeling to the negative aspects of life even to the point of dramatically describing and enlarging upon them. 
All this must be done away with if we are to demonstrate the life abundant of which Jesus spoke. All our feeling, all our attention, all our devotion, all our interest must be directed to the divine idea we desire to be manifest. Not in a spirit of driving, but in a spirit of gently leading, our thoughts, we can, moment by moment, day by day, acquire the spiritual habit of thinking and speaking we are intended to. Through a spirit of love, love for the goodness and beauty and truth of God and His kingdom, love for the joy and simplicity and perfection of Jesus' teachings, we can gradually walk more and more in paths of light and understanding, move more and more into active participation with God's law, reap increasingly more abundantly the blessings that follow. In the beginning of our effort to overcome and be victorious we often have difficulty in affirming wisdom, or life, or success. Each of these goals seems unattainable, far beyond our reach, however desperately we desire it within our heart. Sometimes almost mechanically and automatically we begin repeating such words as, God is my life, or, God is my supply, or, God is my light. Yet, even as we begin, in faith, to take hold of these divine ideas, something within us that spirit of understanding implanted in us by the loving further begins to awaken, and there is a response. Sometimes we do not recognize the response, but it is there, and as we persist in our affirmations our consciousness is awakened to the basic truth contained within the words we have spoken. As we further persist in steadfast faith, more and more love and deep feeling enter into our affirmations until the very words are permeated with spirit life. When we hear speakers give voice to words of truth, as we listen we perhaps feel that spirit life is expressed more fully through some words than through others. Such awareness is simply an indication of the extent to which the individual accepts the activity of spirit within him. As you and I let more and more of God or spirit move in and through us, through our prayers, our words, the more vitally alive and effective our words become until, like Jesus, we need only to, say the word, and the good is made manifest. As we learn to become spiritually discerning, spiritually watchful of all we speak as well as think, we learn to choose words as Jesus himself chose them and utter only right words, good words, constructive words, spiritual words, perfect words. Filling our minds, our mouths, our hearts, with words of truth, we find our lives and affairs also filled with truth. We then find ourselves becoming the word of truth made manifest even as Jesus was, the word, made manifest, visible flesh. Putting aside all words we do not desire, choosing wisely all words we do desire, loving these words, speaking these words, hearing them with the inner ear, expressing them in speech and activity we shall rejoice in the wonder of knowing how to cooperate with our Father in order that He may manifest Himself to us, in us, and through us. Realizing it is always the Father abiding within us that does His work, we shall speak the word with great humility as well as calm command, with great thankfulness and expectation of limitless accomplishment. We shall express our God through letting Him alone speak through us. We shall be His word made flesh. Meditation for self-help. I am free with the freedom of Christ. Through Christ within me I am free from bondage to any person, free from any situation that seems difficult, unhappy, or insurmountable. I am free from any condition that has been called incurable or pronounced impossible to correct. No matter how tightly human bonds and human beliefs have held me, I am no longer a prisoner. I declare in faith I am free with the freedom of Christ. I am unfettered and unbound, I am uplifted and blessed. I am free with the freedom of Christ. I need never run from a situation, avoid responsibility, or struggle to escape appearances, for my release is certain the moment I turn in consciousness to remembrance of the truth that I am a beloved son of a loving father. Right where I am now, my freedom exists. Right where I stand now, God stands with me. Right here and now, my indwelling Christ is the victor and the overcomer. I am free with the freedom of Christ. I accept the truth that within me is an indomitable self that is always unweighted, resilient, relaxed, and free.
in Christ there is no burden of criticism, fear, worry, anger, resentment, envy, false pride, or any other negative thought. The Christ consciousness, which is my natural spiritual state, is not bound to undesirable habits, erroneous thinking, fearful imaginings. It is a consciousness of love, peace, poise, power, joy, and wisdom. Jesus Christ has promised me rest from all labor and heavy burdens. He has promised me that his yoke is easy and light, and I believe his promise. I believe that as I follow his direction and believe in his words I shall find authority and dominion over all situations and conditions. Aligning myself with his ways and teachings, I find that I am unweighted, unbound, free with the freedom he taught. If my daily work seems difficult, I take the advice of the Master and know the truth that sets me free, the truth that tells me I am free with the freedom of Christ. It is God who works with me and through me as my constant guide and instantly available resource. His wisdom, light, and understanding lift me up and out of all tediousness into easy accomplishment. If I have assumed responsibility for the difficulties of a loved one, I affirm, there is only freedom in Christ. I do not worry or grieve, either for myself or for another. I enter into the Christ consciousness of faith and trust. I turn to the silent place of prayer within my heart, knowing that God's will for me and for all is good. If others appear to me to be doing the wrong thing or taking wrong action in matters of importance, I refuse to become anxious about results. I turn again to the thought, I am free with the freedom of Christ, and reject the heaviness that accompanies human judgment and personal reasoning. I refrain from outer argument, even from well-meant suggestion. I release the situation. I establish myself in a consciousness of inner harmony, peace, and well-being, and I have faith that God's divine plan of good for all concerned is being brought forth. My true Christ self is a joyous, peaceful, trusting self. This is the way I was created. I maintain the awareness of my true self by remembering that I am not a creature of burdens, weights, and fears, but a free and perfect child of the Most High. I remember that I am a child of peace, light, and faith, a child of love, gore, age, and wisdom. This is my heritage and it contains no element of limitation or bondage. I accept this truth now and affirm it, believe it, speak it, and act it. Through Christ in me I am free, through Christ in me I am uplifted. Through Christ in me I am unfettered, triumphant, glorious, and free. 9. The Fruit of Patience the young truth student looked worried and fearful as she explained to the counselor the difficulty she was encountering, if only dad could see that by taking hold of an affirmation he could change his thoughts and attitude, I know that the physical condition would be immediately cleared up. The counselor looked at her lovingly and said, I suppose a teacher hears those two words if only more than any others. We are always placing a condition upon the manifestation of the good we desire and it usually concerns the changing of another person. Don't be impatient about this, my friend. Have faith in him, in the spirit dwelling within him. The student broke in quickly, but I have had patience. For the past year one have been praying about this, hoping he would do something that would be helpful. His eyesight is becoming worse, and if something isn't done soon, one way or another, it may be permanently and completely impaired, my dear. We are told, he that believeth shall not be in haste. Your prayers have not been in vain. Your father will find his perfect guidance, but it will not be hastened through any forcing on your part. If he doesn't accept certain ideas you want to give him, don't force them on him. Follow your own true inner direction about this. If you find opportunity, a time when he is receptive, you might give him a strong healing thought. But if this opportunity is not presented, hold your peace and let your patience have its perfect work. Then you will see the reward of this patience in his life and in yours as well. Throughout the months that followed the sincere young truth student held fast to this advice, turning again and again to the thought and practice of patience. Patience with herself, 
patience with her loved one, and patience concerning the outcome she desired to see manifested. Occasionally she found opportunity to offer her father a statement of healing and to encourage him in the application of faith. But most of the time she found that the simplest and most harmonious way of giving was within her own silent prayers. She applied herself, with the continued guidance of the counselor, toward developing a patient attitude founded upon faith. Faith in her own prayers, faith in her dear one's true spiritual inheritance of wisdom, faith in his spiritual heritage of the Christ indwelling, and faith in the Father for perfect outworking of the situation. When her thoughts were drawn to the appearance of the condition, which at times apparently became more alarming, she deliberately turned away and spoke silently within her heart. Sometimes her words were, My faith works patience, or, In quietness and confidence is my trust. At other times she used the affirmation, The fruit of my patience is perfectness, or, He that believeth shall not be in haste. It took watchful self-discipline to refrain from speaking aloud the truth principles that seemed to fill her heart to overflowing. It took constant self-discipline to turn her attention from the outer appearance and to hold to her faith in God's perfect work. During the following year she found it necessary to travel to another state for her employer, but she remained faithful in her stand of patience, knowing deep within her heart that the Father's infinite wisdom and love would still watch over her dear one, that her own responsibility was merely her indwelling faith. Faith in her own quiet prayer, faith in her loved one's true spiritual self, faith in the Father's wise outworking of the situation. Six months passed before she returned home for a few days' vacation. As she sat with the family, which had gathered for an afternoon picnic, one of the children came to her for assistance in taking a cinder from his eye. She turned her attention to help him remove it and noticed her father standing close beside her, watching. As she was deftly and gently removing the tiny object, she heard her father speaking directly to her. He spoke in a low tone but clearly and distinctly. Well, there's nothing wrong with my eye, startled, she turned about for a moment and looked at him. She looked fully into his eyes from a level with her own and beheld immediately their clarity and physical perfection. It had been almost four years since this truth student began to turn her faith in the direction of prayer for healing of her loved one. In this period she had learned patience, self-discipline, steadfastness and how to strengthen her faith. Now she beheld the fruit of her labor, the reward of her patience. She realized that her attitude of quietness and confidence, her restraint from forcing her ideas upon a loved one had helped him to believe and to find his own way of guidance towards healing and blessing. Almost everyone, at some time, finds himself required to call upon patience in the outworking of a situation, condition or appearance of difficulty in his life. There are times when we become impatient with ourselves or others, impatient with life's continuing trials and lessons, impatient because past efforts seem to produce little fruit, and impatient with the apparently small rewards of our long months or years of effort. For this reason Paul admonished his followers, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. For this same reason, Many of the Master's parables stress the importance of patience and steadfastness. When he spoke of the kingdom of heaven, likening it to a mustard seed, we find the words, when it is grown, preceding the promise, it is greater than the herbs, and becometh a tree. Speaking of this same kingdom and likening it to a fisherman's net, we find that the words, when it was filled, precede the gathering of the good from the net. In the parable of the talents we are reminded that it was the faithful, steadfast, servants who entered into the joy of the Lord. In the parable of the seed cast upon the earth we are reminded that the earth bears fruit with, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. In the parable of the sower we are reminded that, the word, within the honest and good heart must be held fast in order to, bring forth fruit with patience. The very first declaration regarding the universe and all creation came direct from the Creator Himself, who called everything, good, and this is the divine pattern for every word of every kind to His children, now and forever.
no matter from whom, or through whom this word must come, it will begin with the loving Father. No matter what needs to be brought about or arranged, what condition needs adjustment, what seems to be taking so long to become manifest, rest in the knowledge that God is at work preparing his good for you. God is at work in the very place where he seems least active, and right there he will become manifest in his greatest glory. He is at work on the very condition that seems most troublesome, and right there he will perform mighty things and bring forth order. He is at work in our very soul, where there seems to exist both good and evil, and right there he will show us our Christ spirit, which is pure and perfect and radiant according to his idea for his beloved. Not a moment too late does God provide, help, and save. Not a moment too late do we receive our guidance when we listen, watch, and pray. Not a moment too late do we receive our strength, courage, and renewed faith when we take firm hold of truth. Not a moment too late will outer changes be effected when we are still and remember that God is always with us. Perhaps you will say that this may be true in some cases but that it has not been true for you. You may feel that God has not helped you, that you have waited and waited and waited in vain for the assistance that you dearly desired and needed but that it has never come. If this is your thought, look to the reason for the delay. There is always a reason beyond that which appears to be an unanswered prayer or a so-called unheeded cry for help. God is ever willing to help, to lift, and to rescue us from any situation. It is we who are not always ready and willing to be helped. Perhaps you will say, you mean I don't want to be delivered from this state of ill health, lack, or inharmony. You can't tell me that. My constant prayer is for help. Remember that there are always two involved in the process of a rescue, the rescuer and the one who is to be rescued. There must be coordination between the two. If we will look impersonally for a few moments at our attitude toward our healing, whether it is the physical, emotional, or financial state of our being, perhaps we will see why the rescue has not been concluded to our satisfaction. If you find yourself discouraged today, dear friend, and tempted to give up because you feel you have been patient to the limit of your endurance, reconsider the words of the Master. Remember that he that believeth shall not be in haste, regardless of whether the time has been four weeks, four months, or four years. It is very possible that this week, as you determine to hold fast to your faith and patience, your reward will begin to be manifested. It is possible that this is the month the fruit of your labors will be harvested. Jesus knew that many would rejoice to hear the promises of the Father that he came to earth to impart. But he knew, too, that his followers had to be deeply impressed with the importance of patience and steadfastness in the fulfilling of the desires of their hearts. He knew that their enthusiasm would reach its peak as he spoke of the kingdom and of man's divine heritage, but he knew also that human discouragement and impatience would dim their vision and slacken their pace. In order to prove to us the value of every assignment, the gain of each lesson in our ongoing, Jesus unhesitatingly moved through every outer difficulty without resistance or impatience, teaching patience as he proved its value, speaking steadfastness as he also proved its value, until finally he had completed his mission on earth. He never sidestepped the obstacles in impatience. He never rode hastily or roughshod over his assignments. He gained from them only greater spiritual maturity, bringing to light even more and more clearly the beauty of man's divine sonship. All the fullness of perfect and eternal life, love, joy, and wisdom awaits every child of God. But this fruit becomes evident and tangible only when we are willing to prove ourselves patient, ready to count it for joy rather than disappointment and discouragement. It is within this challenge that the seed of the fruit lies dormant, and it is within our faith and patience that it is brought into maturity as a tangible blessing. Take heart, dear friend, and know that your patience and steadfastness of the past, your renewed faith and patience of this day are now bringing you into a new awareness of a life of abundance, a fullness of joy, a message of overcoming and victory given by the Master. Continue in this patience and steadfast faith. You shall find that the harvest is great, 
that the fruit of the Spirit will overflow into your life in a measure infinitely more abundant than you have ever dreamed, let patience have its perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, lacking in nothing. Meditation for Self-Help God's perfect action is moving in and through you, in and through every circumstance of your life. Remember this when your progress seems slow, when your financial affairs seem confused, when you are tempted to doubt and fear concerning a move to be made, a stand to be taken. God's action is always wise and loving. It is constantly moving throughout creation, a harmonizing, healing power. Without force, without strain, it moves to bless, to lift, to bring forth good. It moves through your mind to illumine you, to inspire you, to enlighten you. The right action of God now moves through your body to harmonize, to heal, and to strengthen you. The right action of God now moves through your heart to uplift, to cleanse, and to purify you. The right action of God now moves through your life to prosper, to satisfy, and to bless you. If you seek guidance and direction at this time, realize that the perfect action of the one who made the heavens and the earth now moves through your thoughts, gathering them together in spiritual order and strength, develop, in your true purpose, clarifying your vision. Affirm. The perfect action of God directs every thought I think, every move I make, and all is well. If your need is for greater realization of wholeness, Remember that God's perfect activity is the great equalizer of every bodily function, the great harmonizer of every feeling and emotion. Let go of tension and anxiety through letting go of personal striving, through remembering that it is the Father within who does the work. Repeat lovingly, the Spirit of God is active within me, promoting order, harmony, and healing. There is no place where the activity of God is not present. There is no situation in which the activity of God is not in command, in which the activity of God is not at work. As the spirit of success, God moves through every financial understanding, through every business venture, through every transaction. His action is never delayed, it always brings about a perfect solution and joyous progress. Affirm, God's perfect action directs my efforts, guides my desires and prospers my endeavors. There is no haste in the activity of God. If you feel pressed by circumstances, pushed by events, spend a few moments contemplating God's action within His universe. Picture in your mind's eye the quiet, orderly movement of the stars and planets across the heavens. There is no hurry, no confusion, no uncertainty here. God's activity always is one of peace and order and when we remember this it is reflected in our own lives, and our affairs are blessed accordingly. The perfect action of God illumines and inspires you, it moves through your body as renewed life, through your affairs as abundant success. You are a radiant channel, overflowing with the perfect activity of God.